Last time I discussed this competition that we have between the on and the off currents through a MOSFET, in particular a MOSFET that is part of a CMOS gate, which is what comprises the majority of what's inside of a computer chip. Caught in between these competing interests is the threshold voltage. On and off currents place a different demand on what the threshold voltage needs to be. We want a high on current in order to charge all the capacitances, and that requires a small threshold voltage. And we want a low off current in order to have low standby power so we're not dissipating during that operation. And that requires a large threshold voltage. So those seem to be at odds, and there's no way to win, except that there is a way to win. Using a device metric that we're going to develop in the next couple of lectures called the subthreshold swing, this capital S. And that's going to help us to optimize both of these currents, despite their competing demands on the threshold voltage. So we need to spend some time analyzing the subthreshold current. We haven't done that yet. The IV model that we developed in Chapter 6 applies to above threshold. Below the threshold voltage, the drain source current has a different behavior, different dependence on gate voltage than it has above the threshold. There's this definition that's needed. What defines threshold? We've described threshold as the voltage where you develop an inversion charge layer in the channel. That's not a sudden thing where at one instant there's no inversion layer and then you increase a nanovolt and suddenly you have this inversion layer. It's a gradual onset. And so there needs to be a criteria for when we say we're in threshold. That criteria is sort of an industry established criteria. The gate voltage is at threshold when the drain source current equals 0.1 times the width of the channel divided by the length of the channel. That's what's used. That turns out to be a low current. It's in microamps. It's broadly, though not entirely accepted as the figure of merit to use for when threshold has been achieved. So we will go with that in particular because the textbook we're reading uses that as a figure of merit. So let's look up close to the current below threshold, the sub-threshold current. And if you blow it up, make the vertical scale logarithmic, look at it, you see almost a straight line behavior. And if you go look at it logarithmically, which means exponential behavior, when you get to zero gate source voltage, we really don't want any current going through the channel. Because when the gate voltage is at zero for an NFET, we like to say it's off and there's no current. But there is a little bit of current being pushed through. The drain stays high. Current that's getting through is called the leakage current. It's an unpleasant thing. It leads to the dissipation during standby that we don't want to have. So this has a straight line behavior on a semi-logarithmic graph. And the slope of that line is the figure of merit that we're going to uh, start using. So the slope being the derivative of the vertical, which is log of the drain source current with the gate voltage. One over that slope is called the subthreshold swing. It might be convenient if the slope were called that, but it's not. One over the slope is called that, so please don't be confused by the letter S referring to one over the slope. If the slope is larger, that means that we have a smaller I off. The way to, to see that is, imagine you're out here beyond threshold. And what we want is to crash into the vertical axis at as low a value as possible. So we're going to find a way to manipulate this slope without doing anything to what's out here. So if you sit at this point and you make the slope bigger, you make the crash point lower. So you have lower off current. We'll devote the next lecture entirely to looking at the slope, the subthreshold swing, establishing it as a figure of merit in designs. To remind you about the current voltage model we previously developed, the drain source current depends on all these voltages, the gate voltage and the drain voltage, V sub T being the threshold voltage, alpha being the body effect, 1 plus alpha was nicknamed this little M, the bulk charge factor. It's going to still be with us right now. In fact, as you miniaturize devices, it can become rather important, and we're going to keep it. We're also going to rename it for being subthreshold. I'll show you that in a minute. There is a distribution of capacitance between the gate and wherever ground is. We, we can ground the terminals, we can ground the body, just from the gate to the ground. We have the oxide capacitance, and then the depletion layer has capacitance. When you are sub-threshold, you're in depletion. 
And so there's a depletion capacitance to be interested in knowing. And so you have these parallel capacitances. And a tap point in between these two capacitances is called the surface potential. Oxide capacitance is for up here at the oxide. And the depletion layer capacitance is between the depletion layer and ground. And so between those two capacitance is the potential at the surface. And we've talked about surface potential before. And so we can put it in terms of the gate voltage, ground, and the capacitances, just with a capacitive voltage divider. Let's take the derivative of the surface potential with the gate voltage. We're left with these capacitances, and we'll rename it eta, well, 1 over eta. And I might write it like this. I might say, okay, eta is C oxide plus C depletion divided by C oxide, or just like this. And you might recognize it. It's like, oh, isn't that the bulk charge factor from page 210? Yes, the expression is exactly the same. But when we're below threshold, the inversion layer thickness is voltage dependent, causing the oxide electrical capacitance to shrink further. We need to distinguish the bulk charge factor above threshold and below. And so we use the M and the eta, even though it's the same expression. In fact, a lot of books on this subject don't distinguish, and they just uh, keep using little m if that's what they've been using for it. So let's find an expression for the drain source current below threshold. Here's a simple model of the channel. You have the source to the left, the drain to the right, channel length of L, channel width of W, and a depletion layer of thickness W depletion, and I'll remind you of our expression we started with when we developed the IV model, that the drain source current, current from the drain to the source, is the width times the aerial charge distribution, Q, sub n just for electrons, and V, the velocity. We're going to work this out without ever having to figure out the velocity, so we'll keep it simple in that, that regard. The aerial charge concentration, charge per unit area, so we have Q times N sub S, which is charge per unit volume. If you multiply it by the depletion width, you have the charge per footprint, and so that's the aerial charge density. An energy level diagram looking across the capacitance from the body down here through the oxide to the gate metal up there, not depicted in this little picture. It looks like this as we've seen, but what I want to illustrate is how charge ends up in the gate and what it has to do with surface potential. So this is a p-type semiconductor. It has no electrons. It's full of holes, but at no bias voltage, it's in depletion, which means the bands bend down, and so you have this depletion region here which has no holes in it. However, it bends down, which means that this is a comfy place for electrons to go. And so electrons will be here. Where do they come from? Well, they can come from the source because you have the drain to source current. And so you do have a way of electrons to get in there. And so this area at the surface here fills up with the electrons. So it's a thin sheet of electrons between the semiconductor and the oxide. And they, they're comfortable there because the bands are bent down by the surface potential. We can get the density of the electrons in this region just by relying on equation 185. But let's be careful what we use for the energy. I've rewritten what really is equation 185 here, but the conduction band is way up here, but it's been brought down by the surface potential, so I'll write it this way. So there's E sub C. I might say E sub C in the bulk, that's the conduction band edge in the bulk, minus the surface potential is where it's at here. And then minus the quasi-fermi quasi level, but if we don't uh, run current through, then it's just the Fermi level. And so that's our expression for the electron concentration at the surface. And I'll make a few observations. Let's unpack that exponential, putting uh, this new thing here, the surface potential in its own exponential like that. That's all, is that all correct? Looks like it. And I make the observation that the front part of this expression, the first factor, is the electron carrier concentration in the bulk deep inside, because it's just EC minus EF. And so the surface electron carrier concentration is the bulk electron carrier concentration times E to the band bending over KT. Let's take this argument we made on the previous slide with the derivative of the surface potential with gate voltage being 1 over the bulk charge factor, eta, and we can integrate it. So let's split it apart and put an integral sign on there to find an expression for the surface potential. Because what do you integrate from and to? 
When the gate source voltage equals the flat band voltage, the conduction band is horizontal. And so let's integrate from the horizontal position where the gate source voltage equals the flat band to wherever the gate source voltage is now. And the prime is just for decorum. You do the integral and you have a little expression for the surface potential. If the bulk charge factor eta were one, which is often assumed to be the case, you will have a very familiar looking expression here. So the, we'll rewrite the surface carrier concentration as what it is in the bulk times e to the minus this thing over kt, e to the minus q this thing over kt. And I'll go ahead and split the exponential. So if you need to pause the video just to make sure you see going from here, using this and getting this, go ahead, pause. So we'll use that. We'll take this n sub s and sub it in up there to have an expression for the drain source current. We're not going to mess around with anything else because really all we want to know is how everything depends on the gate source voltage. That's how. That's what we want to figure out, how the drain source current depends on the gate source voltage. So we go back to this expression that we started with, put in what we just came up with for n sub s. And so it's all in there. You know, so I W stays, W depletion stays, velocity stays, Q stays. And I'll just say what's in parentheses I'm going to call it big A. It's basically constant stuff. So we'll just call it big A. And then I'll remind you of this industry-wide argument that a MOSFET is at threshold when the drain source current equals this, 0.1 W over L. So we can solve for threshold by changing V gate source to V sub T when the gate source voltage equals V sub T and replacing I with 0.1 W over L and solve for A and then just put it back in. So that's like an initial condition and put it back in and we have I drain sources, what we just saw for A. So we have this nice expression and that is our working equation for the drain source current sub threshold below threshold. This exponential is a negative number getting getting more negative as the gate source voltage goes to zero. And we when the gate source voltage equals zero, you have the off current. Write that down too then. Let's set the gate source voltage to zero and have an expression for the off current. And we're going to use that going forward. So the off current depends on that stuff. And remember the point one W over L is a somewhat arbitrary but heavily agreed upon criteria for when you can consider a MOSFET to be in threshold. That's the typical current in microamps when drain source current starts to take off. I want to point out that the drain voltage isn't even in this expression. Right? You, you have the drain source current, V equals IR, it absolutely should depend on the drain source voltage, yet where is it? And that's a good question. Let's just take a minute to look at it because you're talking about a current from point A to point B and it seems to not depend at all on the voltage from point A to point B. What's going on? I turned to the literature to find a more rigorously derived drain source current expression, not relying on this just once, I'll call it the industry fudge factor, that at a threshold, the drain source current equals 0.1 W over L without relying on that. And you know, it's in, in Mark Lundstrom's very excellent book. And if, if you want to continue with this subject, I really recommend your next read should be Lundstrom's book, Fundamentals of Nanotransistors. And he uses the virtual source model to derive the drain source current. And you'll notice how drain source voltage fits into that as a factor one minus e to the minus v drain source over kt so yeah it's in there so the drain source current depends on drain source voltage that's reassuring does it depend much on it well let's put some typical numbers in here the drain source voltage maximum is whatever the power supply is set to but let's just use a one volt as a for instance vds is one volt then this thing in parentheses is one let's <laughs> just try e to the minus one over 0.026 and you'll realize it's one not even approximately one. I mean, there are way too many zeros in between the one and the next digit. It's one. It drops out for uh, all but the smallest drain source voltages. So if you turn the drain off, you set it to ground, 
or just above ground, like 20 millivolts, it matters. It, it will have an effect. But it doesn't have an effect by the time it gets to 1 volt. It stops having an effect probably above about 150, 200 millivolts. So that's the reason why the drain source current doesn't depend on the drain source voltage below threshold, unless the drain is turned nearly or all the way off. It also tells us something about how electrons get from the source to the drain. Transit from source to drain does not depend on the potential difference between the source and the drain. They're not going there by drift. They move from the source to the drain by thermionic emission. There is a potential across the channel that has a hill in it and goes up. The electrons thermionically jump over that potential barrier to keep moving. So the electron flow from the, the source to the drain depends on the temperature, but does not really depend on the potential difference. This is going to be an issue in a coming up lecture because the drain voltage affects this potential barrier and changes the current and that's a process that we'll call drain-induced barrier lowering, where you turn up the drain and it becomes easier for electrons to, to jump over. We'll, we'll take a, a look at that, but it's not drift, it's, it's thermionic. Okay, so when we pick up next time, we'll start looking at the sub-threshold swing, the inverse of the IV slope, and we want to be able to cause the IV curve in sub-threshold to reach zero gate voltage at the lowest possible current level so we don't have a lot of standby power.